Alright everyone, welcome to the Agricultural Unit. Before we get started on the main information from the chapter, we're going to take a look at a little bit of a background and summary of what we're going to be learning about. There were three agricultural revolutions during uh, human history. The first agricultural revolution was about 12,000 BC, so about 14,000 years ago. This is when hunter-gatherers, people just roaming around looking for food, started to settle down. And they started to plant crops that were able to sustain them. The next agricultural revolution comes much, much, much later. That's the 16 and 1700s. This is when we first start using mechanization. This is when we first start using early tractors and other machines to help make uh, planting crops and farming easier. Finally, we get what's the third agricultural revolution. This is also called the Green Revolution. This occurred during the 1960s and 70s. This is when we really start using intensive mechanization, when we start using factories to help process food. We start using more mass consumption of chemicals on the ground, when we start using biotechnology, and when we start really getting into food processing. So let's go ahead and start looking at Key Issue 1 a little bit more in depth. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the first agricultural revolution, the origins of agriculture. Humans started out as hunter-gatherers. They lived in tribes of about 50 people, and they roamed around looking for food. They didn't get much beyond 50 people because that's all the land could sustain. Men typically went out and hunted uh, wild animals. Women stayed closer to the camp and looked for berries and nuts and other things to eat. These tribes usually avoided each other because they couldn't waste resources on battle and they typically didn't have the time or energy to battle. You're spending them looking for resources. Today there are actually about a quarter million people that still are hunter-gatherers, mainly in Africa. Well, as humans developed agriculture, it uh, changed how we lived and it, now, it, it enabled cities to be able to form. Agriculture first started in Southwest Asia about 10,000 years ago, so 8,000 BC. They started growing things like wheat and barley and oats and items like that. Rice about that same time period was being grown in East Asia. At about 8,000 years ago, we started seeing sorghum being grown near Mongolia. And then later on, Latin America starts about 5,000 years ago. They start to grow things like potatoes in Bolivia and Peru, cotton, beans, and maize, which is like corn, in more of the Central American area. Now later on we start seeing animals being incorporated into farming. Southwest Asia is where we started thinking that uh, domestication started occurring and that was about eight to 9,000 years ago. The first animals that were domesticated were cattle, goats, pigs, sheep, uh, your typical what we would think of as being farm animals. Dogs were domesticated a little bit before that um, and uh, were very much used in protection of the village and uh, guarding animals that were later on uh, captured and farmed out. Now, you might be wondering, how did humans figure all of this out? Well, most likely with crops, humans started uh, first seeing what animals were eating and uh, started attempting to eat the same things. But how did they figure out where to grow things, how to grow things? Scientists probably think that as humans were staying in a general area, they started seeing that when they discarded um, their garbage, their seeds, that things started growing there, and they figured out, put two and two together, and that when the seeds were being dumped, they started growing, and they learned just to line them up in rows. Um, as far as animals being domesticated, most likely they started becoming used to uh, humans. They probably started moving closer to humans, eating what was being thrown out, and humans finally figured out, hey, let's capture them and put a fence around them and we're going to call them ours. So that's probably how they started um, being able to get a relationship together. Now, they also started figuring out, while well, humans were discarding this garbage and the animals were like, hey, we like eating that, humans also started figuring out that their waste could be used as a fertilizer. So they, it became a symbiotic relationship. Now, one of the things they really want you to know that it's not till after 1500 that we see major crops move across the planet. During triangular trade, maize and potatoes are brought from the New World and taken to the Europe and Asia. Things like wheat and barley and oats, those are taken from Eurasia and brought to the Americas. So those two groups of people had never seen those crops until they were traded during the triangular trade era. Alright, so let's go ahead and take a look at subsistence agriculture and commercial agriculture. 
Subsistence agriculture is food growing on, in small farms or in village farms, kept just for the person or the village. Commercial agriculture, that is when a farmer is purely growing it to sell off. We usually see uh, subsistence agriculture in LDCs, and we typically see commercial agriculture in MDCs. Well, a geographer named Derwent Whittlesley made a map, and we're going to take a look at that. What he did with this map was kind of drew out where we typically see the type of farming and in what type of climate we typically see it. And this map is actually really important, and if you see it, it actually has also a pattern. Because what you'll find is that most of the commercial farming is done in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, where the MDCs are. Most of the subsistence agriculture is done along the equator area where the LDCs are. The reading then continues to go on that there are five distinguishing features between subsistence agriculture and commercial agriculture. The first is purpose of farming. The second is the percent of the farmers in the labor force. The third is the use of machinery on these farms. The fourth is the size of the farms. And the fifth is the relationship of, other, of farming to other businesses. Now the rest of the key issue breaks each one of these down in more detail and that's what we're going to do right now. Alright, the first category we're going to look at is the purpose of farming. In LDCs, most of the people are growing food just for themselves or maybe for their small village. Their main goal is not to sell it in a supermarket situation or at a market of any type. MDCs, it's completely different though. We see more commercialization of the farm. When we look at MDCs, including like Canada and America and parts of Europe, these farmers are growing food pre, uh, primarily just to sell. That's it. We also are going to see farmers are more specialized in MDCs. So they're not doing what like we think in the 1800s where they have some corn here, some potatoes here, some tomatoes here, cucumbers, peppers. They're growing more just one or two items. They're growing only uh, green peppers or only cucumbers. They're focusing in on one or two items. And that's what we typically see more in the MDC type of scenario. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at is the percent of farmers in the labor force. In MDCs, about 5% of the entire labor force is farmers. In North America, which includes Canada and the United States, it's only 2%. In LDCs, about 50% of all their labor force is working in farming. So what does this mean? What it means is that in MDCs, we are much more efficient. We have the technology to use. So we, it takes very few farmers to be able to grow a massive amount of land. Now there's a reason why we see so many people leave the farms and move away. And those come down to the push and pull factors. First of all, the push factors is that there's machinery that really, really starts to dominate in the MDCs. And it's also very low pay on farms. So many of these people are pushed away from working on farms. The pull factors are the cities. In cities they offer higher paying jobs and more jobs. So starting in the late 1800s, we start seeing a lot of push and pull factors come into play in which people left the farmland and started moving into the cities. All right, our third category is use of machinery. And the big difference between MDCs and LDCs on this is that LDCs don't have a lot of machinery. And there's, there's several reasons why. First of all, MDCs can afford it. Machinery is very expensive. Combines and tractors can run over $100,000. So it's very difficult for a poor farmer to be able to ever afford that. MDCs, they can't afford that more often. Another reason why MDCs can dominate and move to commercial farming is transportation. Railroads starting in the 1800s helped move crops and uh, animals much easier. Roads were built and superhighways here in, in MDCs and trucks and the ability of using warehouses. Science also becomes a huge factor in MDCs being able to dominate commercial manufacturing. Much of what is done on a farm is learned in a university. A lot of people don't realize many, many farmers have college degrees. These are highly ed educated individuals who have to use science to be able to effectively make their farms work. So much of the, much of the factors that universities dominate in the MDCs, farmers are learned, able to learn better techniques and use better science. It's the fact that new fertilizers are always being invented and used on farms. New herbicides are being used. Uh, hybrids of uh, plants and even animals are able to be more likely used in MDCs because of the money that is there. Um, new um, GPS is able to be used. 
And uh, believe it or not, a lot of tractors actually have GPS on them and it tells the farmers exactly where they have moved their combines along so they don't repeat in an area or miss an area. In fact, we've probably heard of Google Cars where cars are driving themselves. They are actually having tractors now, right now, used that operate themselves. They can guide themselves and be able to reap where uh, farmers need them to go in fields. Our fourth thing we're going to look at is farm size. Commercial farms dominate the MDC and these farms are very, very large. Now one of the things that sometimes we hear maybe in the media or we might read online is that there's no family farms left and the corporations own them all. That is not true. 98% of farms are still owned by families. Now the difference is families don't go out and sell their product by themselves. They sign contracts with companies. So if I'm growing green beans, I sign a contract with maybe like Del Monte or Green Giant and I sell all my green beans to that company. I'm not going out into the marketplace and selling them myself. A fact that's very interesting to hear is that the largest 5% of the farms in America make 75% of the country's agriculture. That is how big these farms are. That is how efficient these farms are. So again, the largest 5% of the farms in America make, the, make 75% of the country's agriculture. That's crazy. And they're very efficient, and that's because of mechanization. Now, to mechanize a farm, it's very expensive. Combines and large tractors run $100,000 or more. So a lot of these farmers live their lives in debt. That's why in some farms, in some communities, farmers will share the equipment. They pull their money together and then buy the equipment. But farmers live in debt most of their time. During the summer and winter time when they're not making money, they have to take out loans. They then pay those loans off in the fall when they reap their uh, products that they're getting and pick their product. And then they go back into debt. So farmers aren't in it to make a lot of money. It is very hard labor and they work very hard. Now, fewer farmers than ever are employed in America. We see very, very few farmers today. In fact, we see more land being used for agriculture today, even though more and more land is being used for, for uh, urbanization. So while cities are going out and expanding and taking land and cutting down farms and uh, expanding out and moving out, we actually see more and more land being used for farming, and that's because we're becoming more and more fit, efficient, and we're able to use land that previously wasn't able to be farmed on. Uh, we're using new technology to be able to farm on it. Alright, our fifth category and the last one that we're looking at for Key Issue 1 is the relationship of farming to other businesses. The big word that they need you to know for human geography is agribusiness. And this just means anybody involved with farming and how it applies into the business um, realm of uh, a country's economy. So these farmers we talked about previously, they sign contracts with major corporations. And that's how the corporations get their food. Well, farmers are about 2% of our labor force, yet 20% of all Americans are involved in some kind of ag part of the agribusiness. So what are they doing if only 2% are farmers? We have the food processing part. So we got the part where somebody is, is picking up the crops and delivering them, putting them in factories, how they're being processed in factories. We have the packaging part of it all, where they're being put in cans or being put in frozen bags. We have the storing of it all in warehouses. We have the distribution part of it where it's canned and it has to get to the store and then we got the retailing part of it, the grocery store aspect of it all. So when we look at the agribusiness, it's much more than just the farmer out there. It's all the little bits and pieces that takes that food going from the farmland to get to your table or the restaurant or wherever else you're purchasing it from.